Well, I think we could agree we've got three very well-informed people to be guiding us through this conversation. Roger, I wanted to kick off with you. CASE is a pretty loaded acronym. There's a lot going on in that conversation. How far are we off uh, that reaching a point of being combined into a commercially viable product or proposition? And what's the most challenging element of the four? Um, I think we're quite some way off, in truth. It's not tomorrow. Um, I think it's not technical that's the, probably the big challenge. I think it's uh, cultural. It's um, you know, people sharing in close proximity a small vehicle. Um, you get used to doing it on the train or the bus, but let's be honest, you can always, you can always move along a bit, can't you? you know, sort of, or whatever. So, you know, I think, and I know we've talked a bit about, you know, the, the blend of these things. So I think it's cultural more than technical. Um, and when do I think they'll all come together? You can, you can pick a various, you know, range of uh, timings, but I'd, I'd say it's closer than we think, maybe five to ten years. Oh, that's pretty optimistic. All right. Now, Jasper, I wanted to ask you, shared smart mobility is a conversation and a phrase we're hearing a lot more of at the moment. What does it mean and what does it look like when we bring that to life? Yeah, well, uh, shared smart mobility, I mean, I should preface this by saying my job is to kill the car. So there is no <laughs> doubt my job is to make it faster, smarter, cheaper <laughs> than cars, except on the racetrack. <laughs> except on the racetrack where it's still a little bit sexy. But ultimately, my job is to show, as we were saying before, that SUVs are as sexy as STDs, right? That's where we want to go in the future. So uh, recognizing... There's a tweetable <laughs> quote if you needed one for this session, ladies and gentlemen. Right there. Talking about cultural transformation, uh, recognizing that that's ultimately my job. Uh, <laughs> Uh, autonomous, connected, smart, shared mobility really is about making sure that our cities move people as fast as possible, as economically efficiently as possible, and as energy efficiently as possible. And there is no competition with mass transit in that scenario. The problem is that mass transit has historically been set up to be uninnovative. Uh, it's not been set up to actually employ people who are disruptors. It is nobody's job to disrupt transit. Uh, and so what we do is ultimately we work on moving buses faster, moving trains faster, redesigning cities, getting that first mile, last mile solution solved through low speed autonomous electric shuttles, and then ultimately innovating the financing mechanisms that stranglehold our transit systems today. Wow, when you say that, it makes it sound easy. <laughs> and sexy. There's a lot going on, and sexy, and there's a lot going on in that. Lucas, we were having this conversation earlier. You know, it surprises me in many ways, and maybe this is acknowledging my own bias, that, you know, a race car driver would be at the forefront of almost doing himself out of a job in some ways. But one of the things that I found, you know, interesting, Roger touched on the social element, that really one of the, the key components we've got to acknowledge in this innovation is that um, we've got to get people comfortable with it. Talk to us about, because uh, I look at Formula One as a reasonably conservative industry and the progress that you've seen in the last 10 years, I actually think gives us a lot of optimism for where we're heading next. How easy or hard has that journey been to get acceptance of this innovation? Um, the, the motorsport industry is very uh, old fashioned. Uh, as incredible as this sounds, uh, they tend to uh, relay in the past. It's very about, it's a lot about passion, so they tend to uh, try to keep what, uh, what actually created that passion in the past. So it's very difficult to do what we're doing. We, ha we are having a lot of resistance from the, from the industry. Um, but the analogy that I use, which is uh, for, for motorsports, is a bit like horse racing. Horse racing, in the beginning of the century, it was a mass sport. Everybody rode horses, so horse racing was uh, a super important sport. As, as society progressed, you only ride a horse if you want to. You don't need to ride a horse anymore. And with cars in the future, it will be in the same way. We'll have, there is horse competitions, there is horse uh, jumping, horse racing. Uh, it became more of a niche. Still, it's there for people who liked it. And cars will be the same. If you want to own your car and want to a racetrack and want to have the adrenaline to go fast and, and drive, you'll be able to do that. But uh, on a day-to-day, -day, people drive less and less. And uh, uh, this will uh, create, for motorsport, having so many categories, so many professional drivers, to a much uh, smaller niche in the future. 
jump in? Yeah. yeah, actually, if I if I may, just to build on that, I mean, what we've been talking about a lot is cultural shift and then urban redesign and how much are people actually going to drive. But when you speak about sort of the conservatism in the industry, I think it's really important to share with folks, you know, what's happening here is in the supply chain is, is an extreme disruption to suppliers who have made their money off of a certain kind of supply under the hood of vehicles, whether that's buses or cars. And, you know, if you're in the oil sector and you're looking at the disruption of your supply chain, you kind of feel this at your heart. But lift the hood of an automobile that's electric versus an automobile that's based on thermodynamic combustion. You know, what's underneath an automobile that's based on an engine system is mostly magna parts, an engine with a few kinds of suppliers. It's mostly standardized technology. It's transmissions, and that's pretty much your tech. If you lift the hood of an electric car or an electric bus or even an electric rail car, you've got motors, electric motors, which have only really been brought into hybrid landscape for automakers. You have power electronics. You have battery packs battery management systems, these are not the technologies that companies like Magna and others who have made their riches off traditional car making have designed and developed within their supply chain. So you have these new suppliers like LG Chem and Panasonic and Samsung, power electronics makers from the aerospace industry coming into the auto sector. That is what is ultimately causing this backlash from a lot of the auto sector and where you're getting these peripheral cars on the side because of emission standards and cafe standards and accommodating compliance. But underneath that hood is a complete transformation of the supply chain and a lot of people stand to lose a lot of rich jobs. And that is ultimately what is causing that backlash in the slow pace, and some would argue, of the adoption of electric vehicles. Not so much our culture alone, but that actual supply chain that adds costs and causes challenges. So if I can ask on that then, how is the business model changing and how does the business model of some of the incumbent players need to change? C can I? Jump yeah. In. Yep. Well, if you, if you, in fairness to say... Banking, three big industries, banking, energy, and, and transport, mobility. Uh, they've all been around for over 100 years. They all know what to do. They're all pretty good at it. The unintended consequences of the things that we've, you know, Michael was pointing out and talking about are there. But the truth is, until, you know, there's a shift in terms of the business model, mm -hmm. both the, the cultural change and the business model, then, you know, it's hard to see some of this stuff happening at, at the pace we want. Personally, I think the shift from, electric, um, from combustion engines to electric vehicles isn't going to come from ownership. I don't think the masses are just going to switch to EVs. I think what's going to happen is they're going to switch from owning vehicles to using vehicles because of economic factors, social factors, increased urbanization. And incidentally, I don't mean everywhere for everybody. So I'm not saying it's like they press a button and overnight none of us can do stuff anymore because as uh, you know, you were saying there's, there's a bunch of things still to be done. AI isn't perfect. Voice recognition isn't perfect. Yeah. Getting driverless cars to work properly. Um, there's a great advert, by the way, by Alpha. I put it on my LinkedIn page the other day of just how bad uh, voice recognition can be in terms of getting something to work. And are there any Scottish people in the audience? <laughs> yeah, I'm really sorry you've got a problem because it doesn't understand what you're saying. Um, <laughs> And that can be quite important when, when you're driving. So I, I think you know, the shift to answer the question about it's, it is about culture, it is about economics. So finding ways in which you know, you're selling data, you're selling um, energy, you're selling different transactions and owning a vehicle. Mm. That's, a, that's a big part of this stuff that's going on, I think. Josper, talk to me about the new P3 business model. What's happening with that and how is that part of this shift to a new business model? Yeah, sure. So if we get out of the car domain and we think about shared mobility or transit mobility for a moment, yep. you know, when we talk about fleets, very different business models, right? When we talk about public transit fleets, they buy up front in large purchases of off-the-shelf commercial products. Typically, city councils do not allow you to mix capital costs with operations. And yet, if you're going electric or hydrogen fuel cell, your savings are in your operations, right? An electric bus over diesel can save you somewhere like 30000 to 100000 per route per annum. Uh, yet, you show up to your city council, and you can't argue, give me all the money for these $1 million electric buses now, given that I'm going to save all this money over 18 years of their life cycle. We just don't allow that. So the business innovation starts first with breaking up this antiquated notion that capital versus operations are two separate budgets because yep. we're not going to get transit innovation if we do that and continue. Now, having said that, it's going to take a while for me to convince all the mayors in this country. We've started, but it takes a while. Uh, so what we've done is we've reached out to innovative companies 
good or bad, good branding, bad branding, companies like SNC Lavalin, uh, Ellis Dawn, companies that have cash to burn. And these are companies that have gone into the business of operations and maintenance. And they've done it for rail, they've done it for infrastructure. We know these as P3s in Canada, good or bad again, some better than others. And what that means is these companies will offer you effectively low interest loan, amortized over 18 to 30 years. Now you're a transit agency, you can buy that $1 million bus and you can offload the problem of those $1 million on route high power charge chargers so you don't have to take care of this high power electronic equipment, offload that to a contractor that is used to operating, maintaining and charging you a slight fee to do that for 18, 20 years. Now we get totally away from the problem of transit agencies today saying, look, we don't have subway lines so we don't have engineers who are electrical engineers on staff. We don't have the operations capability to handle 450 kilowatt charging systems. We don't have all of that capacity. Offload the problem to a financer who's going to amortize the cost over 18 to 25 years. That is where we're going with the business modeling while we try to convince those city councillors to break up those operational strangleholds. Lucas, I want to go to the, the business of Formula One for a second. You've mentioned in motorsport there's kind of three pillars that you need to, to balance or think about when it comes to innovation. One is uh, overall cost, the second is entertainment, and then there's the technical development piece. Which one of those is, is the trickiest when you look at the here and now of where the development of robo race is at? It's difficult to say which one is, is trickiest. For, for us or for any uh, motorsport series uh, to succeed, you need, to, you need uh, manufacturers. As, as you mentioned, they are in the mid uh, of a disruption and they don't really know where to go and how they do it with their uh, engine manufacturer uh, supply chain and what they're going to do. So we need to create R&D, uh, uh, the freedom of R&D so the manufacturers are attracted to our product which is the, the, the racing series. We need to create enough entertainment uh, so people watch it. And we have to keep the cost low as, as low as possible so we have sponsors and we have somebody paying for it and the, and the, and the whole product and the whole uh, operations are sustainable. So this is, let's say, the, the holy grail of creating uh, a racing series, keeping these three pillars balanced. Now, Roger, we've touched on a lot of the technology needed to enable mobility itself, but what about the infrastructure piece? What do we need to be thinking about from that standpoint for CASE to be, to be brought into true fruition? Yeah, I, I think when you look at electric vehicle charging around the world, in general, and I know this will irritate a few people here who've got charging companies, it's been a bit of a bloody mess. Um, certainly some of the government investment and the programs in the UK that, that kicked off plugged in places Lots of charge points were in the wrong place. They weren't maintained. You know, there's lack of interoperability. There's a bundle of things which, you know, just are clunky, you know, not so good. So I think we're going to see um, a re-emergence of one particular charging proposition, which uh, kind of fell out of favor because the guy who um, um, put it about, uh, Better Place, um, who in the room would feel comfortable with losing nearly a billion dollars in a startup? Um, well, yeah, oh, oh, I, you saw, would. I saw okay. one hand. That's cool. Good for you. Yeah, go for it. Um, well, unfortunately, that's what happened with a company called Better Place. Better Place was battery swapping. Mm. Uh, it worked on the principle of if cost and range and charge time was the problem, get rid of those three things. And that's what Better Place was there designed to do. Ahead of its time, picked a, a particular car that wasn't especially attractive, the Renault Fluence. Sorry if you're from Renault. Um, <laughs> And uh, that stuff. So, so battery swapping is coming back. Mm -hmm. Neo have just announced that and shown that in China with their, uh, their ES8, their, their SUV vehicle. So that's interesting. Wireless charging, I think, is almost like the dark horse of electric vehicles. It kind of is something which has been around a very long time. You know, Faraday himself and Nikola Tesla understood what it was. We haven't yet seen that. That delivers a lot more interoperability. You don't have to have a charge card. You don't have to have the right connection. It's just electricity like magic through the air. Um, so I think wireless charging and battery swapping are coming. But I think that whole piece of connecting up, as Michael was pointing out, where the, the vehicle sits, fleets of electric vehicles with their batteries in helping and mitigating vehicle to grid, grid to vehicle, it's all part of a big jigsaw. It's all kind of coming together. Um, so that would be my, my thought. Do you want to pick up the macroeconomic? Yeah, well, I'm going to take it to a higher power level. You know, who was it that said if brute force is not enough, you're not, or if brute force doesn't work, you're not using enough, something along those lines. Uh, so if we talk about electric cars, you know, high power charging for electric cars is 50 kilowatts to 100 kilowatts. High power charging, 
means 150 kilowatts, 300, 450. We're now working on 600 kilowatts up to one megawatt. We're talking about super fast charging to drive down the charging episodes, not to minutes, but to seconds, including for buses, trucks, camions. And the idea there, if I could add to your, your concept about it's a bit of a mess in the auto market, what we've done is try to push forward the idea of standardization. And not all companies like that, because if you made your sales based on proprietary models in 2015, yeah. 2016, you wanted to keep those proprietary locked in models. 2016, 2017, 2018 came around, fleets wanted low cost charging. The only way to get to high power, low cost charging is standardization. So now we've moved forward and kudos to the op charge community, Volvo Group in Europe, leading into something called the SAE J3105 standard in North America. This is high powered, integrated, interoperable charging. And they're, overpower they're overhead systems that are gonna be effectively a fleet of something like municipal lighting. So we have lights on our road, we have street lights. These are gonna be part of our urban infrastructure. And these things can power up any type of heavy duty or light duty vehicle in the future. And that's where we're going because they're already developed. So standardization is the key to bringing down the price point. Standardization of these high power systems yep. allow fleet ownership of this electronic equipment for fee for service business models. And they allow cities to really get involved in launching smart city enabled capability for all vehicle types. It gets out of this proprietary model of some dude or some gal needs to choose what kind of charging system she or he wants in their garage and it gets into a system of infrastructure of electronic equipment. Look, Lucas, I want to touch on, you mentioned in your talk that motor racing at the get-go really gave people faith in the automobile, which I thought was a really interesting point. And you've said that your work with RoboRace is about the cooperation of human intelligence and artificial intelligence. What I'm interested in is how do you see the work that you're doing in a motorsport sense rippling out to the broader innovation that we're going to see in mobility and transport and cars? Um, yeah, I'm going to answer that. Just I'm going to come back to the to the charge infrastructure, which, well, for example, we're having problem with Formula E. Mm -hmm. Of course, when you you want to create fast power charge, so high power, not about energy, but high power, you need a, a battery that can allow to receive this power in yeah. this time. You need to cool this battery in the right uh, amount. 600 kilowatts is quite a lot, so you need a huge battery to receive that. Yeah. Um, uh, and in, in Formula E, we're seeing, we're seeing many cities that the bottleneck is the infrastructure change. And I'm from a third world country, I'm from Brazil. And by far, changing the priorities on electric infrastructure is not, from the government, is not the priority at this stage. So I think this is, for me, uh, one of the, the key points, how uh, the infrastructure, the technology will be there, is already there. But the, how the, the, the and we are, we are trying to influence with Formula E and with RoboRace, uh, a little bit the cities. So we race in city centers with RoboRace, like you saw in Rome. We race at the city center, Paris, New York. We race in Brooklyn. Uh, we race in Montreal last year was the final. And so on, we race in Hong Kong, Hainan, and so worldwide championship. And what, what we're trying to do is to influence the leaders and the community that this is a foreseeable future and we need to act, to not, act now on the infrastructure. Can I pick up on a point you just raised there, which I think is a really critical one, that it, this isn't a priority for every part of the world, and this is also uh, enormously expensive when we think about the investment in infrastructure and what's needed to create really these hubs of innovation that are pioneering this technology. Do we at all risk a growing socioeconomic divide with some of this, and is this just an urban game? What happens to people in regional and rural areas? Uh, well, it's a good question about urban, suburban, and, and rural. And, but actually, I think it's the other way. I think transportation and mobility will become more inclusive. I think it's been quite elitist, uh, you know, up to now in many ways. I think the car brands, you know, for all their virtue, and, uh, you know, I've had the good fortune of working for some nice car brands. I worked for Audi. I had a nice Audi. It made me look, make the car look, you know, made me look good. But I think that world is starting to change. I think yeah. the value of a car brand and the cost that it has to you personally let alone the broader cost, is, is a kind of changing dynamic. And, and I think just the ability of people to move around cities and move between their workplace and all the other things should be democratized more, should be you know, um, accessible to the masses. So I, I think you know, we're seeing some big shifts in that. And if I ever pick one graph um, in, in a PowerPoint presentation, someone says, don't give me all these bloody slides, give me one. There's, there's one called motorization per thousand of the population. And that's a massive difference. In India, it's 22 per 1,000 of the population. In the United States, it's 840. 
In China, it's about 160, I think. So there are these massive differences already in these countries between ownership and use. Mm -hmm. So we're going to see a different shift because of where we are today, you know. But I think countries like India and China will be at the, the forefront of this because they've got the biggest challenge. Yep. They've got lots of people in very busy cities and they have to find a way around all these sort of things. So um, I think we'll see the lead from those two, particularly China and, and India is going to play catch up. Um, but I, I do think it's, it's going to democratize transport more than make it elitist. I don't, do, you, do you think that? Yeah, actually, I'd maybe make a divide between urban and rural again, but not necessarily uh, in a, the substantial way you might think. So first off, urban, of course, you have more fleet adoption, so the cultural impetus is there, because yep. fleets don't do a nice kind of exponential or logarithmic growth. They do a stepwise function, right? They buy a few, they test them out, then they go to a fleet procurement. So it's a stepwise function, and if you live in an urban-dense environment and you see that there's going to be a cultural impact an urban dense environment makes more economic sense for the infrastructure deployment so urban dense environments like in Canada since we are here let's talk about the ones we have downtown Toronto downtown Montreal downtown Vancouver that's about it for our really intense urban uh, density environments. In those three environments, you're going to see a different kind of adoption rate yep. because of those economics. Mm -hmm. And having said that, just from my personal experience, I used to own a Nissan Leaf. I mean, I've drunk the Kool-Aid, I believe in it. Uh, but I live in downtown Toronto, and a parking spot is 60,000 bucks. So six, about six months ago, I went car free because for 60,000 bucks, I could buy a mansion in Winnipeg. Uh, you know, why would, I, why would I spend that amount of money? Now, okay, you might say, Yospa, not quite fair. You don't have children. You're right. Uh, I have decided to utilize my uterus in a certain way so I don't have kids, and I get it. I get it that having a car free environment or being car free in a downtown urban environment makes economic sense, but maybe not sure. time sense for families. Yep. So that's where I'd speak then to the rural or the suburban issue. Uh, and that's where we really need to make it economical for families and convenient for families to either go shared go electric or combination of shared autonomous on, on demand. And the problem, again, coming from Calgary originally, is when you're sitting in the middle of where I grew up, Forest Lawn and Marlboro Park, really close to downtown, but some of the most degraded communities in this city, undervalued uh, property, and you're sitting in a city that has allowed developers to vomit suburbs all over the place <laughs> with no pricing on kilometers from downtown to whatever privileged suburban environment you live in, you know, those price points don't make it cheap for families. Mm. Those price points and the ability to buy a big house far away from downtown, drive an hour in your SUV or your minivan with your kids and still not pay as much as living downtown without a car. That kind of economics will not change our substantial DNA as cities. So for us to be able to connect suburbia and then the rural environments around farming and so on into the autonomous electric mode, the low carbon mode, the high speed mode, we really have to start issuing the right pricing signals, which means redoing city politics, which means rezoning our land and privileging denser communities downtown. And from that, you then get the economic motive to really deploy these kinds of systems that make economic sense for families. I see you twitching, Roger. You've got to jump in. Yeah, well, what's Winnipeg like? Uh, just it's gorgeous, except for the flies. <laughs> get a mansion there. I might move there. <laughs> Is it okay? Lucas, have you got anything you want to add in terms of what you're seeing at home in Brazil versus some uh, of the hubs of yeah, really uh, innovation yes. activity? Um, just one topic that was not spoken yet is very, very light electric vehicles that will complement this fleet and urban transportation. Yeah. So I myself, I started the first uh, electric bike company in Brazil last year uh, because also the cost per kilometer and the social impact is super low on, on electric bikes. And we believe that uh, if the infrastructure is the bottleneck in these developing countries, when you have light electric vehicles like bike, and in Brazil the average temperature different from here is 20 degrees, 25 all year long in Sao Paulo, uh, we think that uh, light electric vehicles can have a, a, a faster impact sooner uh, because then you can charge on your already built infrastructure without a problem. If you plug an electric bike, we are developing, a, um, we are using a battery technology that we charge a 100 kilometer range on an electric bike in six minutes. Wow. So it, it is, it's not because of the power, it's just plugging in a normal socket and it will charge the bike. So we, we are also looking to this um, segment. Great. I don't know about bikes in Calgary winter, but I can yeah. see that yeah, working really well in, uh, in summer. Yosemite, you touched on the challenge of changing city politics. Um, every bit of this case conversation to me just looks like a regulation minefield in many ways. Um, how easy or difficult is it navigating some of the changes necessary for this technology to be able to be fully utilised? 
Yeah, I mean, people will say, look, politics, taxes, subsidies, they're not part of the marketplace. It's disrupting the marketplace in an unfair way. Look, if you don't recognize that politics, regulation, and tax subsidies in some industries are part of the marketplace, it's because your brain is as creative as a gray smudge on a white wall. That is part of the marketplace. And in reality, in this community, let's take, take a look at Calgary as an example. Uh, Calgary has done something really innovative that demonstrates that it is thinking outside the city politics box, but it's also recognizing that politics and regulation and demonstration can be part of the marketplace. So if you're out in Calgary and you take a, the LRT to the zoo station, some of you will know that the city of Calgary has proposed this idea of an autonomous uh, light, uh, light electric vehicle that will take you from the LRT station to the Spark Science Center. And those of you who live here know Know that if you get off at the LRT station, you either go to the zoo or you want to go to the Spark Science Center. But between the LRT and the Spark Science Center is a swath of parking lots and no sidewalk and no way to walk with your kid in a baby carriage. But who goes to the Spark Science Center? People with kids. And so this design has led to people driving to the Spark Science Center. So what has the city of Calgary done? Really intelligently thought about, let's try a first mile, last mile solution there because with a light, electric, autonomous shuttle that is on demand for people who arrive, order it on your phone like an Uber, but it's part of Calgary Transit, that allows people to take the LRT system, leave the car, home and get to that Spark Science Center without having to put a high cost empty bus on that service and then try to justify to the taxpayer why you should subsidize a high cost empty bus mm -hmm. on that route. And that's only an 800 meter route. Though we have loads of those first mile, last mile problems in this country because we build the backbone of LRTs and subways and regional rail and then we don't connect the local transit system or the local mobility and we end up with these first mile, last mile problems that lead to cars. So part of the city politics is recognizing a design problem has a technology solution, but it has to have political will behind it. Mm -hmm. And if you combine those two things, you can actually create an attractive economic investment environment for global makers of these new technologies. And it is a bit of a wild west. Where these technologies are going to be developed, where they're going to be manufactured, is still an open question. And Canada has a lot to offer in terms of being one of the first out the gate in terms of offering these demonstration sites and attracting that investment. Great. Uh, this is a, a question to all, all of the panel, really. We've got 1,500 leaders from across the world that are passionate about this conversation here in the room. What do they need to be devoting their brain power, effort and energy towards when it comes to advancing this conversation? Uh, I think it's a bit of what's already been happening this morning is you meet people, uh, you talk about what you do, you find you know, things that, that link together, you, you find ways in which you can put two people you know, in this big room there's lots of matchmaking to, to, to go on. I, 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 don't mean, I don't mean dating. You know. But um, uh, I, I think the way in which we connect up now, I mean, I'm a big advocate, as you, you, I think you mentioned, uh, of LinkedIn. LinkedIn isn't, well, it was just a recruitment tool for a while, to be, to be honest. Um, but it's so much more than that now because it's a way in which people can engage together, find out things that they can do. People can, you know tip things off, they can do all, all sorts of things to, to broadcast mm -hmm. the good news, to evangelize. Um, I, I, and on that note, and not just because they're a sponsor, Graham hasn't asked me to say this, but um, if I ask the question uh, in the room, who has, which company has most electric vehicle charge points in Europe today? It's Shell. It's an oil company. And Okay, that's with the acquisition of New Motion, but they bought New Motion. They bothered to do it. They're starting to do things, and I'm, I can't go through the whole bunch of oil companies and what they're all doing, but I know, I know a bit more about what Shell are doing, um, and I think that that's the stuff that's important to share. That's important to leverage that, um, both for Shell to leverage that, but for us to do it with them and to push them to do more and more and more. And just as Michael was pointing out earlier on in his fantastic presentation, mm -hmm. you know, this is about don't take anything for granted. I think anyone in the electric vehicle sphere who thinks game over, everyone's buying electric vehicle tomorrow, is an idiot because that's not the case. It's like pushing a bloody great big rock. You know, you're heaving it and pushing it and it moves maybe a tiny bit, but it's only until it starts to gain that momentum and it starts to roll down the hill that, that you're, you're in, in the game, you know. At this time, electric vehicles are not taking off. They're not. So all of us in this room, in our, all our different ways, need to help make that happen by evangelizing, connecting, talking about things, and, and bringing things to the fore. 
So I don't know if that answers the question. It's brilliant. Because I do ramble on a bit sometimes. Sorry. About what would you, okay, what would you like to add? I'll put on my Canadian flag and talk a bit about right? the Canadian story. So there's three parts to it. One is, first, if you're a leader in this sector, you've got to recognize this is not just an oil and gas problem in terms of those shifting landscapes. In Canada, it's an auto sector problem, too. So it's an east-west problem. Our auto sector was caught sleeping at the wheel. Our governments did not invest at the time that Obama was pumping money into Michigan. That's why the Chevy Bolt and Volt are not made here. It's why the Ford Focus was done in Michigan. So our auto sector is stuck in the last century as well. So it's a it's an east-west problem in Canada. That has to be recognized. Secondly, to solve the problem, there are two things I'd recommend in short term. One, as I mentioned, liberate transit agencies because transit agencies are not what you thought they were before. Some of them are stuck in the Middle Ages, but a lot of them are championing these new advanced technologies and transit agencies are large demonstration sites for advanced engineering technology integration. And Canada has a pressing dynamic need. So liberate those transit agencies to be able to finance these new technology innovations that will enable the growth of that sector of new knowledge economy jobs in this country. And then third, recognize that the future of the energy sector may well be with utilities. And in this country, we have a lot of utilities. In particular, we have vertically integrated utilities, BC Hydro, Manitoba Hydro, Hydro-Quebec. Hydro-Quebec makes over $100 million a year in licensing IP that it spins out of its R&D center. Most folks don't know that. They spun out TM4, an electric motor company that makes electric motors for cars, electric cars, electric buses. I mean, this is an advanced, innovative utility. It's pushing the agenda on solid state batteries, one megawatt charging. That's a utility. That is a utility that's going to be an energy developer, an energy innovator of the future. And we have loads of utilities like that across this country that could be at the forefront. Even in this province, utilities like ATCO and NMAX are really coming to the fore for strategic innovation. So the third thing I'd say in Canada is if you're a leader in the sector, recognize utilities may be the leader and they very, very often should be a strategic leader in the new energy transportation matrix. Brilliant. Lucas. Um. For, for what I'm doing is basically the, to showcase these technologies in a controlled environment. So we think in the same way this, this technology is not seen by so many people and the trust and understanding these technologies is a huge part of acceptance. So by show, showcasing Formula E, racing at high speed, something exciting in city centers that attract people to see, to see the electric cars as sexy, by show, showcasing uh, autonomous and electric technology in the robo race, we'll do the same. So that's, uh, that's our goal. Brilliant. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I think we've had an absolute treat getting to hear these three brilliant thinkers uh, over the course of this morning. I'd love to take the opportunity to get you to turn to the person next to you, maybe someone around you that you don't know. Share your top insight, your top takeaway from what it is that these three have had to share. We'll give you, give you about 30 seconds to have a quick conversation with the person next to you. Uh, yeah, it's brilliant, isn't it? It's sexy as. Wonderful to watch all the engagement. Okay, how am I gonna? <laughs> it's just gone off now. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you so much, everyone. It's great to see all the chatter that that has created in the room. I look forward to that continuing over the course of our networking break. I hope that gave you the opportunity to talk to someone you may not have already met. I hate to bring the chatter to the close, but I might just for. Just for 90 seconds, we're going to wrap our panel up. Final closing thoughts, each of you, I'll give you, give you 30 seconds each. What is the thing that the audience can be keeping their finger on the pulse of in terms of the exciting, most cutting edge development in, the, in this field? What, sh what should they be watching? 
I think it's, uh, it's about connectivity. It's about how things are going to be drawn together. It's basically under the umbrella of um, uh, 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 the circular economy. It's really about how things that have been separate will join up. It was alluded to by Michael in terms of uh, blockchain and some of these other aspects of uh, connectivity, liberating assets, taking things that are dumb assets and turning them into smart assets. So in other words, we'll all get better value out of stuff. Stuff will be more economical. It will be more usable by more people. And they are parts of the key towards finding solutions to, to the challenges of climate change. Awesome. So I, I think it's about connectivity. Great. Yosipa. Yeah, I'll switch gears and talk about energy storage. In this landscape, uh, we talk about the vehicles, but the vehicles grid and the intervening intermittent technology of energy storage is key and critical. And in Canada, we put on my nationalist hat again, my Canadian flag, I'm a good nationalist. Uh, in Canada, we do have that kind of technology development. So the future for really high powered, efficient, whether shared or not, electrified mobility is gonna be these charging systems integrated with energy storage uh, with supercapacitors and ultra caps that deliver power at a variable rate. So look, for, look out for that as the next uh, technological development in the electric vehicle landscape. Great, and Lucas? Um, I will have to, to choose automation. I think that will disrupt many, many, many sectors um, from uh, driverless cars to surgeons to um, lawyers, uh, automation and artificial intelligence will definitely disrupt a lot of the industries. Great. Well, what a wonderful panel session. Can you join with me, please, in thanking Roger, Josefa, and Lucas?